Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to day two of the uh, 2019 Diggers and Dealers Mining Forum. Uh, without any further ado, if you'll allow me to introduce our first speaker, Mr John Wellborn, CEO and Managing Director of Resolute Mining Limited. Thanks, John. Thanks, Reg. I thought there'd be a bit of a bigger intro. Um, <laughs> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be back at the Diggers and Dealers Forum. Uh, and first of all, let me congratulate you for coming in here. I just said to Carl, they're obviously all copper bugs. Um, <laughs> dragged themselves out of the morning to listen to the King of Copper later on. Uh, I'm delighted you've come to listen to the Resolute story. It's a great honour uh, to represent uh, our company here uh, at a conference where 30 years ago we won Digger of the Year. Um, so we're back here and we're still hunting for another award. Uh, and uh, it's been exciting times for anyone who's listened to the story over the last few years. Let me get straight into it. I'm going to go through uh, our portfolio of mines today and talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, and where we're heading. Uh, our usual cautionary statement and this presentation is available on our website and, and on the platform. Uh, here's a picture that will be familiar for anyone who's followed Resolute over many, many years. Uh, the new addition, though, is the Mako gold mine in Senegal. Uh, and that's an acquisition that we announced uh, last week. It's a very exciting addition to our port portfolio, and I'll be talking about it today. Uh, our flagship project is the Siama gold mine in the south of Mali. Uh, this is a mine that was discovered by BHP in the 1980s. Uh, it was owned by Rangold before being acquired by Resolute. Uh, and so, as I like to say, what would those two guys know about gold mining that we can't teach them? Uh, and that's where we're building the world's first fully automated underground sublevel cave gold mine. Uh, and that's the other key element of my presentation this morning. Resolute also owns the Bibiani gold mine in Ghana. And we're the owners and operators of the Ravenswood gold mine uh, in North Queensland. Uh, but it is nice to come back out here to Kalgoorlie where this company and its forebear, Samantha Gold, cut its teeth in mines like Chalice, Mary Meyer, Bullabulling, uh, Higginsville uh, and others. Uh, and Mako represents our 10th gold mine uh, and a significant addition into what is increasingly, as you can see on this map, an African-focused portfolio. Uh, the Mako gold mine in eastern Senegal uh, last year, in its first year of operation, produced 157,000 ounces of gold at an all-in sustaining cost of 655 US dollars an ounce. Uh, this is a nice, simple, easy gold mine. Uh, it runs how a gold mine should. It's an easy open pit on the side of a hill. Uh, simple processing and recoveries, very high, above 90%. Uh, and effectively, you know, the, the most challenging thing about our due diligence program over the last few months was to have on having, having to keep on reconciling uh, the cash balance as it went up by $10 million every month that we delayed. Uh, so we're delighted that that cash is now flowing into Resolute. Uh, it's got a seven-year mine life. We're very excited about the opportunities to add to that mine life. It's been a very successful development by Martin Horgan and his team. They made this discovery 10 years ago. They were financed by, uh, predominantly by three private equity groups uh, who were looking for an exit, and that's the opportunity for us to take this private asset into our portfolio. It also means that uh, since defining the ore body uh, a couple of years ago, they haven't invested a lot in exploration, uh, and we're really excited about the near, near mine opportunities as well as the portfolio that we've inherited with this acquisition in Guinea and particularly in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, this was the headline uh, of our announcement last week. Uh, I've run through the production metrics. Um, the, the mine's going to produce approximately 140,000 ounces a year uh, at an all-in sustaining cost of around 800 US dollars an ounce over the seven-year mine life. Uh, and, and that's what we bought and that's what we're going to uh, integrate into Resolute. But there's huge opportunities regionally for us to look at how we can augment that mine plan, particularly around that exploration. A big effect on Resolute's guidance. You know, two weeks ago, we, uh, our guidance for 2019 was to produce um, 330,000 ounces. The addition of this mine takes us to 400,000 ounces attributable to Resolute over 2019. But our annualised uh, guidance is now, with the inclusion of the MACO ounces over 2019, is actually 490,000 ounces for 2019. So I have, uh, since I first joined Resolute four years ago, uh, along with most of the mid-cap 
juniors have been following a pathway to being a 500,000 ounce producer, we're almost there. Uh, this is a nice picture of Senegal and the Mako gold mine, beautiful part of the world, uh, lovely country to operate, very progressive mining friendly jurisdiction, a francophone mining code that we're used to and a very progressive uh, government seeking uh, external investment and uh, the mining convention that Toro Gold have negotiated is one of the best I've seen and consistent with every area of this operation which has been well developed uh, and is operating well. You can see the uh, the simplicity of this open cut mine uh, and the topography, it's quite a small compact footprint in Senegal uh, and we're delighted to have taken the keys on Friday, we announced this transaction on Wednesday, it's a very simple deal um, uh, and uh, we're now operating this mine uh, as of today. Moving on to Siama. Um, uh, I've mentioned the scale of this operation, it's, a, it's an incredibly large ore body. Uh, we mined it to a depth of about 250 metres in the open pit. The main Siyama open pit we stopped mining in May of 2015 and ever since we've been developing what is going to be one of the world's most sophisticated underground mines which we believe will operate for decades to come. It's been an investment of almost 300 million US dollars. Uh, and I'm delighted that in the, the back end of 2019, we're going to be delivering that project and ramping it up. Uh, recently, we announced that we've achieved commercial production rates, so we're above 80% of the nameplate capacity. And the exciting uh, work that's going on on site at the moment is the commissioning and the implementation of that automated mining system uh, that effectively turns Siama into a rock factory for the benefit of our shareholders. We believe this mine is capable of producing 300,000 ounces of gold a year uh, across many more years than the 14-year reserve life we currently have in the underground mine. Uh, it's a phenomenal ore body. That's why BHP built the mine uh, in the first place. Uh, it's a kilometre long. It's 200 metres thick. Uh, it's open at depth. Uh, and every time we drill to extend it, we add ounces. Uh, our ambition across that uh, 300,000 ounces of annual production is to produce that at an all-in sustaining cost of below 750 US dollars an ounce. And with where the gold price is heading at the moment, that means that this mine will produce a huge margin, both at current gold prices and any um, foreseeable gold price environment. Um, so that's a very exciting project and that's what we're delivering at the moment, uh, as well as mining some satellite ore bodies uh, very successfully, particularly the Tabricaroni ore body that we've developed during that development of the underground mine. It's 30 kilometres to the south and it's augmented our production while we've been ramping up this underground mine. You can see that the uh, sublevel cave starts directly underneath the completed open pit uh, and we've partnered with Sandvik uh, to build an incredibly sophisticated and efficient and safe mine by implementing equipment that they've been working on for more than two decades. All of the equipment that we're implementing at Siama uh, is actually currently deployed in autonomous modes around the world. The difference with Siama is that almost all, all of that equipment has been retrofitted into existing mines and Siama represents the first opportunity where a miner has had the chance to purpose build a mine for a complete automated system uh, that connects the mine uh, face directly to the ROM pad. Uh, and uses all of the automated equipment you can see here. Autonomous long haul drill rigs, autonomous loaders, autonomous haulage, uh, and very significantly for a sub-level cave, that allows you to have a, a level of control that has not previously been possible in, in any mine. Uh, so let me show you a little bit about how that looks uh, and come for a bit of a journey. Here's the open pit of Siama, uh, processing infrastructure, uh, and the new control room, which is going to operate the mine. Uh, one of the key elements of automation is the ability we have to train our local workers to uh, use and apply the mine. Often the automation is seen through the lens of replacing jobs, we think it creates jobs. So we've just gone through the automated portal into the mine. You can see the sublevel cave here. It's a very efficient bulk mining method underground, leaves no pillars, extracts the entire ore body. This is a very fast forward version of what we'll be doing over the next 14 years in terms of the current reserve. Uh, we started at the top levels there. That ore is currently uh, hitting the mill in increasing quantities. 
uh, and will ramp up to full capacity. This is the mine that we're mining. If you look quickly, you can see that we start in the centre and it's like dominoes going out, and that goes layer by layer. So this is a very efficient mining method. Uh, Sub-level cave, we're the owner-operators of the Mount Wright underground mine in North Queensland. Uh, there we've mined a two and a half gram ore body to 900 metres underground at a delivered cash cost of 850 Australian dollars an ounce. If you'd announced that in the feasibility study, no one would have believed us. Um, so as a miner, we've pioneered uh, the sublevel caving method uh, at Mount Wright. We were early adopters of teleremote technology. We've taken that one step further here at Siama uh, with a fully automated underground fleet. So let me show you what that looks like. Uh, this is one of our long hole production drill rigs. These are currently working in autonomous mode at the Siama mine. Uh, they find their location themselves uh, and then they drill out the pattern uh, and allow the uh, draw point to be blasted. We're actually seeing 21% increase in accuracy of that drilling. It's allowing us um, uh, to get fragmentation uh, results that weren't previously possible with manual drill rigs. Um, that accuracy allows us to have less hang-ups less, and much more control. It's, it's also bringing benefits that we didn't foresee. Under manual mode, we were getting about 800 um, metres out of each drill bit. And so one of the things that we uh, implemented on these drill rigs is an automated bit changer. What we're finding in autonomous mode is that we're getting more than 3,000 metres per drill bit. So we no longer need to use the bit changer because we, the uh, entire ring can be drilled with one drill bit. And we actually think we'll end up getting more than 4,000 metres a drill bit. Just a, a direct example that we're already seeing of the advantages that we know that automation is going to bring us in terms of direct efficiency cost control, uh, along with the other benefits that we did foresee. So once we've charged out the face, we then use a, a range of automated loaders. Uh, we have electric tethered loaders as well as diesel loaders. Uh, I'd be delighted if we could electrify all of our equipment underground, but the uh, technology's not there yet. Um, here's a quick snapshot of the... This is the existing, this is in a cartoon. This is our control room at Siama. I like to think it looks a little bit like the uh, bridge of the Starship Enterprise. That's where the, the entire operation is controlled. Importantly, those chairs are not to tele-remote these loaders. You're just monitoring and watching the machine work. So Sandvik's uh, auto-dig feature on these loaders uh, means that the machine will operate itself and the uh, controller on the surface is just there to assist it if there's a problem. Uh, you've just seen we, we're using ore passes at the lower levels, but at the moment this is the uh, split uh, loading uh, in full automated mode that we're currently commissioning at Siama. Uh, so once you've drilled out the draw point in a fully autonomous drill rig, we then have an autonomous loader that then loads the autonomous haul truck, which then winds its way through the, the completely autonomous decline to the surface. Uh, you'll notice that these machines still have a cab. They still basically have based their design on a horse and carriage from the 1800s. Uh, I'm, very, I'm, I'm convinced that the industry will move quite quickly to haul trucks that looks like uh, bathtubs on four wheels. Um, we have no expectation that this cab with its air conditioning system and stereo and communication systems will actually be used. Uh, obviously, it's a mitigant that we've described to investors when they've said, gosh, this automation seems a bit uh, groovy and what happens if it doesn't work? Um, so the reality is, is that at full capacity, this mine has nine haul trucks working. Uh, so you're talking about replacing nine drivers with an autonomous system. It's not about labour saving, it's about safety and particularly efficiency uh, as we build a, bigger, a, a much better mine to provide lower costs. Um, this is the first mine in the world that has laser-guided trucks underground that, that uh, transition seamlessly at the surface to GPS guided above ground. You've just seen the passing loops we've put in that autonomous decline, obviously. Uh, these are not trucks that wait or beep or have to reverse for each other. They know where each other are, just like a railway system. Uh, and so that those crossover points are seamlessly designed. The speed of the truck coming down uh, ramp and the speed of the truck going up ramp are managed so that they uh, occur seamlessly. Uh, and here's a, a cartoon version. Obviously, the truck actually doesn't stop. One of the things that we've tested is the ability for these trucks uh, to progress at pace from laser-guided underground to GPS-guided above ground. Uh, and this is drone footage of, obviously, the truck in autonomous mode arriving at the ROM pad. You can see the guides there uh, and then fully autonomous dumping. So what you've just seen is a modern mine where the ore is coming from the face underground at the draw point 
all the way to the ROM pad without ever having been manually handled. Uh, this is a process in a sub-level cave that we will repeat time and time again, year in, year out, uh, very efficiently. Very exciting, and it's happening as we speak. Um, so the benefits of automation are quite obvious. Um, uh, in an African context, we're already seeing the ability to have Mali and crews trained to use this equipment. It also means that we can monitor the mine, not just from the mine site, but anywhere in the world. We can build uh, um, control centres anywhere where you can be connected to fibre optic cable. And if you've got the time to visit our booth, which is booth number 133, um, Peter from Sandvik can show you how that actually works uh, in one of our control chairs, which is, is sitting in the booth. Uh, and John Wheeler, our head of projects, can put a virtual reality goggles on you and you can come underground at Siama or uh, above ground and walk through our processing facility. So if you're here for the next couple of days, please drop past the booth and you can see more uh, of the Siama mine. Uh, this control centre that you've just seen is a key part of this mine. Obviously, all of the equipment we're using with Sandvik is very groovy, uh, but what really actually drives the cost saving is our ability to control this mine in real time. Um, military people tell me that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. As a former professional sportsman, I know that the, all the work the coaches do goes out the window once the ball gets kicked off, uh, and at half time, the coach tries to retrofit the game plan back into us and remind us what we're doing. Mining's a bit the same. Anyone in the mining industry will know that uh, morning meeting where you work out what the guys over the night shift have done uh, to stuff up your mine or what yesterday's plan was changed uh, compared to plan and how you have to fix it today. And then as soon as you get underground and there's a hydraulic cable broke or something else happens, um, you're, you're the guys at the end of your shift telling the next shift what went wrong on your, your shift. And ultimately, someone at the end of the month works out what's happened and tries to retrofit the mine plan back into the next month's plan, and so it goes. Um, this, the, the mine that you looked at there cascading down uh, is one that the control of it is actually fundamentally important in order to maintain dilution as well as consistency of feed for the mill. Uh, the digitalisation and the automation of the mine means that in real time we can understand where every kilogram of ore is moving. Uh, we have a mine plan for the Siama Underground Mine which is designed by Deswick. There's a software interface where that comes directly into Sandvik's OptiMine technology. That then tasks the machine so that the uh, auto mine function of the loader and the auto mine function of the haul truck is actually directly linked in real time to our mine plan. Any changes to the mine plan, any changes to draw point management are immediately incorporated through the, through the shift boss uh, into the system. Uh, so that there is no retrofitting of this mine, there is no inefficiency, we control it uh, absolutely and it's going to lead to much better grade control, a fundamental part of making Siama an efficient low-cost mine when you're dealing with a double refractory sulphide ore body. Quickly, I could talk about automation forever in terms of many of the benefits, safety, particularly the African environment training, but one that's obviously fundamental to us is cost. Uh, we spent a lot of time studying Sandvik's deployment of their machinery in mines like North Parks in New South Wales and at the Finch Diamond Mine in South Africa. Uh, and we were convinced that their claims of 20 to 30 per cent savings were accurate, and we're already seeing that in the equipment that we've delivered. Um, but where does that saving come from, and where are we driving those efficiencies? So this graph uh, shows the productivity uh, of a normal mine, an underground mine, and you can see that you know, during the J shift there's various distractions, meetings, uh, and other activities that means that productivity is actually lower than in the night shift. You've obviously got lunchtime break, you've got uh, uh, changeover points, uh, all of which affect the productivity. The first benefit of the modern mine is actually the control of information that I've described. So by accessing digital information in real time, what you actually do is get a 10% productivity benefit, but all it's actually doing is increasing the high productivity periods of the mine. You're still not getting productivity during changeover points and you're still having the dips in production during the course of a shift and during a course of 24 hours. But if you've got the digitalization of this mine and you're controlling the data, you can then automate the mine and that's where you get a significant um, increase uh, productivity, so 10% by digitalisation, we believe it's going to be you know, an extra at least 20%, perhaps more, through the automation. And the real change is where those low productivity periods or no productivity periods 
are actually augmented by automation. So obviously during blast periods we can have automated equipment working underground. There is no need to change or to stop those machines from working. Obviously an automated machine doesn't stop to go to the toilet, it doesn't have a crew bake, it doesn't get fatigued. Uh, it just keeps on working hour after hour, day after day, month after month, year after year. Um, and this is something that's very exciting for the industry. You know, I, I often challenge people uh, about the resistance in the mining industry to obvious technology like this. Um, and I spoke at a, a mining forum in Brisbane recently where I'd been challenged that it was crazy to do what we're doing in the south of Mali, this you know, high-tech mine in a, in a developing country. And I'm convinced that it'd be crazy not to. Uh, to me, anyone who's running the sort of mine we're running without using automated equipment is as crazy as you and I walking into a CBD building and being asked by a bellhop wearing a little hat which floor we'd like to go to as he shuts the grate on the elevator. All of us travel around the world in airports. We'd be surprised if we were going from Terminal 2 to Terminal 3 in a train driven by a, a, a driver. We, we take it as normal that we get in those trains and they just take off without anyone driving them in an automated fashion. What is difference with a haul truck in a mine? Uh, you know, the fact that we put drivers in these things is as crazy as having a bellhop and a lift or a train driver being Terminal B and Terminal C, particularly in a mine uh, like Siama, where it's a lot of repetitive activity. We have a draw point structure uh, and uh, a routine of haulage, which can be replicated much better by machines than it can be by humans, both from a wear perspective and a safety perspective. Um, so what we're doing at Siama is exciting. I think it's important for the mining industry. Obviously, this forum over its long history has been driven often by exploration. So I did want to talk about uh, the opportunities we have at Siama beyond the obvious ore body that we're exploiting and will continue to exploit for decades. Um, we have an 80 kilometre stretch of the Siama belt from, from north of Siama and south of uh, Siama to the Cote d'Ivoire border. Uh, it has a range of incredibly exciting targets which are untested. Uh, when I joined the company four years ago, there were 27,000 drill holes in the Siama database. So you could assume that the belt had been incredibly well explored. If you went down 200 metres, there were eight holes, and all of those were at the Siama ore body. So at any modest depth, this belt is completely untested. Every time we drill on targets at that depth, we we're discovering more and more sulphide ore. Um, the key to Siama is being an efficient, high recovery uh, producer of gold from sulphide ores, and I'm convinced that there's an untold quantity of gold inventory available for us. We've proved that at the Tabracaroni mine that I mentioned. It's 30 kilometres to the south of uh, Siama. If you've got very keen eyesight, you can see the very shallow oxide deposits that we're currently exploiting uh, and trucking that ore 30 kilometres and processing through the separate oxide processing plant we have at Siama. But we also have a number of drill rigs working on what we believe will be a second future underground mine at Siama. Um, and if your eyesight isn't that keen, let me run through some of the drill intercepts that, that run along the bottom there. 12 metres at 98 grams a tonne, 32 metres at 7, 20 metres at 18, 44 at 12, 43 at 7, 23 metres at 10 grams per tonne, 25 metres at 8, 34 metres at 5, and so it goes. Uh, I challenge anyone here, any of the mining companies, to show me uh, hits at moderate depths of 250 metres of that tenor of grade. We've announced a uh, resource here, an initial resource consisting of a, a made an underground resource of a million ounces at five grams. This is going to grow. It's at a very modest depth. It's within 30 kilometres of four million tonnes of crushing infrastructure we have at Siama. It's another huge value driver for Siama, so keep your uh, eyes peeled on that exploration. I know I'm running out of time. I, I do want to talk about our Ravenswood mine very quickly. Uh, this is currently producing 60,000 ounces a year at a pretty hideous cost. It's been a fantastic res uh, generator of value for Resolute. I mentioned the Mount Wright Underground mine. Uh, obviously, we have four million ounces or more of resources within a four square kilometre radius of the mill. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we upgraded our reserve there to almost three million ounces of gold. We believe <coughs> this can be a tier one Australian mine. It is low grade, but at scale, it has the potential to produce 200,000 ounces of gold a year for 15 years. That's the sort of mine that we and many others would love to own. We're finishing off that uh, strategic study work and we'll be updating the market during the current quarter or early in the next quarter as to our plans on how to deliver that mine, the capital cost and the timeline. Um, 
Obviously, we're also in the Bibiani gold mine in Ghana, and we've indicated to the market we're going to make a decision on recommissioning of that mine uh, before the end of the year. That portfolio allows us to demonstrate our ambition to be a multi-mine, low-cost, African-focused gold producer. Here is a quick summary of the mine. If you look at the reserve base across there, it's almost 10 million ounces of gold. All 10 million ounces sits underneath mills that are fully developed, we own and control and can demonstrate, achieve high recoveries. That is an unprecedented opportunity for a gold company in the current, in any gold price environment. If you add up the capacity of those mills, 300,000 ounces at Siama, we believe Ravenswood's a 200,000 ounce a year mine. Maco has demonstrated they have low cost production of 140,000 ounces a year and Bibiani, when commissioned with a 3 million tonne per annum mill, has to produce at least 100,000 ounces a year. So we've got capacity. Previously, I've said that we're a 500,000 ounce a year miner. We've delivered that already today. The capacity of these four mills is 750,000 ounces, and that's our next ambition. Um, a quick diagram as to what's happened with the acquisition of MACO. I mentioned earlier about our jump in guidance to just under 500,000 ounces a year annually. Uh, and you can make your own comparison against our production and our costs against the market cap of our peers. Uh, I remain convinced that there is huge exploration and development value in the African gold market. Uh, we're seeing a mature gold market in Australia, uh, and the gold that we mine in Africa sells exactly the same price per ounce as the gold we mine here in Australia, um, and Resolute is going to continue to build value with a bigger and bigger gold inventory and more and more low-cost, efficient mines. A quick corporate summary, you can see that the re-rate uh, around uh, the reality that Siama is going to work has started to happen. I would expect that will continue uh, as we commission the Siama automated mine during this quarter and then we ramp it up to full capacity before the end of the year. We pay a dividend based on our uh, revenue. You can see our guidance is growing as our costs are coming down. Um, we're very excited about the future. We've mined 10 mines, we're looking to mine 10 more, uh, and we'd be delighted for you to come past the booth, have a look at what we're doing, uh, and hear about it in more detail. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John. Uh, we've got time for one very, very quick question. John, where are you on hedging at the moment? Sorry, John, where are you on hedging at the moment? We uh, have a portfolio view on hedging. So the MACO had some very uh, light hedging with the refiner that we'll deliver into in the next three months. Outside of that, um, we have about 160,000 ounces hedged and an average of about 1,300 US dollars. Uh, our hedging program was really designed around the capital we were investing across our business in upgrading our mines. Uh, our policy is to hedge 50% of 12 months production during those sort of development um, periods. Uh, if you think about our reserve base, we've got less than 2% of the reserve, I think, hedged. So a very modest hedging policy, and obviously like every miner, we wished we weren't hedged at the moment, uh, but it was an appropriate responsible step uh, at the time, and we'll deliver into those hedges. They represent uh, less than 50% of our production over 12 months. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Cheers.